Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm very uh, pleased to be here. Uh, I should say I'm excited to be here and somewhat anxious. And I'll tell you why a little later. Uh, I am a historian by training. That is my professional uh, career. But I'm also a historian uh, by calling or avocation. Uh, I'm originally from Augusta, Georgia. Uh, I've been on the faculty of USC for 15 years. But uh, although I am sort of trained in historical methodology, I am really a storyteller at heart, in part because that is the world in which I live. I mean, stories will often communicate to me on the front porch of my grandparents' home in a public housing project in Augusta. These were stories conveyed to me in church, conveyed to me walking to the store, riding the bus, in school, in the library. So today I want to talk to you about stories that have come to my attention largely not from history books, though some have, but many from the voices, the memories, and the experiences of those who lived and witnessed struggles for civil rights and social justice here at home, here in Columbia. Uh, I've been fortunate to be a part of a project called, entitled uh, Our Story Matters, Columbia SC 63. And this is a work to recover and to give voice and visibility to largely overlooked, untold stories about the struggles here in South Carolina uh, toward civil rights uh, and social justice. Many of you who've taken classes in American history may know stories about Birmingham, or Selma, or Memphis, or Jackson, Mississippi, but we know little about what occurred in our own backyard here in South Carolina, and especially here in Columbia. Many of the lessons that I have uh, learned that I will transmit to you today come from individuals that we've spoken to or students that I taught who, who sort of collaborated with me uh, in doing research on civil rights here in South Carolina. This is a photograph uh, taken uh, on August the 10th, 1948. It is the first day in the 20th century that an African-American can vote as a Democrat in South Carolina. It was the result of a major civil rights case called Elmore B. Rice that compelled the Democratic Party of South Carolina to open up voting to all residents of the, city, of the state uh, despite their race or ethnic background. The person standing at the front of the line with the umbrella, the white patent leather shoes, and the white dress was a woman I had a chance to speak to who was born in a place called Fort Mott, South Carolina. She was born there in May of 1909. And she was ecstatic about this day because it was the first time that she could vote and vote as a Democrat. And she had long memories about what this day meant for her family and for her children and what it meant for her as a young member of the NAACP in South Carolina. She told stories about joining the NAACP when she was in eighth grade, uh, paying 25 cents. And when I went to talk to her about her memories of her life in South Carolina and about civil rights, uh, she at the time was uh, almost uh, completely deaf and legally blind. Her mind was amazingly sharp. And so I would say, Ms. Wilson, would you mind telling me your story? And I would shout it so she could hear it. Uh, and finally, once she understood what I had to say, she said, well, how much time you got? <laughs> so that lot to communicate about this experience. And this was five or six years ago. And remember I said she was born in 1909. Well, this past November, that is Ms. Wilson at age 105, wow. coming out of the Ward 9 voting precinct on Jamea Street, still active, still alert, still excited about telling stories that she told me were largely overlooked in the textbook of her children and her grandchildren. So today I want to talk about these amazing people like Ms. Wilson who compelled all of us not only to rethink history, but also to reevaluate ourselves and to begin to do some assessment about what all of us can do to be important change agents in the world around us. 
1946 and 47, the gentleman in the middle, George Elmore, was a local grocery store owner on Jabez Street near Millwood. Uh, Mrs. Wilson frequently patronized Mr. Elmore's store. In the mid-40s, Mr. Elmore struggled to gain the right to vote and was denied. Ultimately, Mr. Elmore was able to register to vote. But at the time, the person who was doing the assessment of those who registered thought Mr. Elmore was white. But in fact, he was a Negro. And once it was discovered that Elmore was African American, quickly uh, efforts were taken to deny him the right to vote. He therefore sued the state of South Carolina and ultimately won. His case was argued by the dashing attorney in the top right, Thurgood Marshall, who had come to South Carolina regularly uh, on behalf of the NACP. It was Thurgood Marshall who helped to open up the voting rights uh, in South Carolina. There was also a very good marshal that to argue a case called Briggs v. Elliott, one of many cases that came together on May 17, 1954, entitled Brown v. Board. The real roots of Brown v. Board rest right here in South Carolina, argued by individuals like Thurgood Marshall. Ms. Wilson was very quick to talk about many other folk individuals who deserve greater attention. May 17, 1954, was a famous Supreme Court case, Brown v. Board. But May, uh, June 22, 1954, should have been an ordinary day for the woman dressed in black. Her name was Sarah Mae Fleming. She knew Garnesbury Road quite well. It was a road she would take from Eastover to her home in downtown Columbia, where she worked as a domestic. And on June 22, 1954, Sarah Mae Fleming left her home, boarded a bus, and got to the intersection of Taylor and Main Street. It was there that she transferred from one bus to another, and that bus was to take Sarah Mae Fleming from the corner of Taylor and Main to Five Points, where she worked as a housekeeper for a very common family. Well, while moving from Taylor and Main to Taylor and Washington, history happened. It was supposed to be an ordinary day. Mrs. Fleming sat in the middle of the bus, on the Columbia bus, but what she didn't realize is she was sitting toward the border of a bus that separated black and white passengers. The bus driver said, you, you get up now, move. She stopped. Instead of moving back, she moves forward. Not to claim a new seat, but to get off the bus. Miss Fleming, as she tries to exit the bus, is elbowed in the avenue by the white bus driver. Now, this sort of incident happened many times in the lives of African Americans. But on June 22nd, 1954, 17 months before Rosa Parks in Montgomery. Sarah Mae Fleming filed suit against the bus driver and the company that owned the buses, South Carolina Electric, Electric and Gas Company. Ultimately, Mrs. Uh, Fleming's lawsuit leads to the desegregation of buses in Columbia, but also buses across the South uh, in the 1950s, a largely untold story that deserves much greater attention. When Mrs. Fleming was interviewed by a national newspaper, she was a little concerned. She did not want to draw attention to herself. In fact, when she died, her family had little idea of what she had accomplished. She said to the reporter, it was the right thing to do, but I hope it does not cause too much trouble. Now, Ms. Fleming was partially right. It was the right thing to do. But what she did, daring to believe in a different future for herself and her children, daring to believe in the mission of equality, caused a whole lot of trouble. Not only in Birmingham and Selma, but also right here in Columbia and in South Carolina. March 3rd, 1960, here are a group of students from Allen University and Benedict College sitting down at a lunch counter at a local bus station on the corner of Blanding and Sumpter Street. 
They are denied services because they are African American. They are fully aware that they will be denied services, and yet they sit anyway, subject to being arrested. That's March 3rd, 1960. The same day, the corner of Taylor and Main. You ever been to Mass General? Same corner. Here are hundreds of students coming from Allen and Benedict College at this intersection, seeking to enter drugstores, theaters, and hotels, seeking to be treated like any other citizen. But they caused trouble. They were arrested for violating the segregation policies in the state of South Carolina. This young man, age 20 years old, his name was Reverend Simon Bowie. He was a student at Allen University and one of the leaders of this movement. Reverend Bowie went to Edwards Book School on Main Street. Today it's right across from where the Columbia Museum of Art is located. Reverend Bowie is arrested along with his best friend for disturbing the peace. His case is ultimately argued before the United States Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court overturns the conviction of this young man and five other students from Columbia. But if you notice in this photograph, and this photograph is one among hundreds of images that we've uncovered in the course of this project. But this is actually not a photograph. This is a frame of a moving image. This is a video film that has been uncovered in the course of this project. And this is Reverend Bowie exiting the Eckers Drugstore. But what I learned in interviewing him is that before he comes out the door, he says, I have to go back. Before you really arrest me, can I go back and get my books? He was skipping school to be there at Eckers. And I said, well, Reverend Bowie, what were the books? He said, well, there were a couple of science books, but there was the other book, and that book was my Bible. He was a religious student. And he said that day he was reading Romans 12 and 2, which says, be not conformed by this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And Reverend Bowie said that was the mantra of these young people. They wanted to move beyond the prescribed circumstances in which they were placed and to seek a different future to articulate and to imagine a different world. Now, it must be uh, stressed here that the world beyond this space of evidence was a world that was quite challenging to Reverend Bowie. A world where many believed that integration was wrong and that segregation was right. In some respects, Reverend Bowie believed in one version of history, and there were others who were adamant that their version of history was correct. Now, this is why I'm anxious. This, there are two pieces of, of uh, primary documents that were shared with me by a young lady who was trained in history at a school called Hampton. She took my civil rights course and she said, rather than looking at those who fought for integration, I want to uncover those who were adamant that segregation was right. And she looked very closely at this man here. His name was John Adger Manning, who was a champion of segregation, who helped to establish this great school. Now look around the room today, because I don't believe that Mr. Manning, who was a skilled business person, ever envisioned that his school looked like this. And I can perhaps suggest that one of the reasons why your school now looks different than what many imagined was because of the work of Reverend Simon Bowie and others who believed that diversity in education could make sense, that they could be reconciled in schools and institutions across this country. This is a group of students who were marching on the State House in March of 1961. The same group who was gathered in front of the State House that day, 187 of them are arrested. They are arrested for disturbing the peace and for singing. One song they were singing was entitled, We Shall Not Be Moved. The other song they were singing was, My Eyes Have Seen the Glory of the Coming of the Lord. But the last song, 
and for which they were arrested for disturbing the peace was a song that went something like, Oh, say does that Star Spangled Banner. That song. They were arrested for singing it too loud. Ultimately, in 1963, the United States Supreme Court overturns their conviction. One of the persons arrested that day was a 17-year-old student whose name was Frederick Hart. Frederick Hart is sitting in the middle of this photograph, and you can see there's something unusual about Frederick. They call him Rick. Rick was a 17-year-old freshman in Carolina. He was coming from the campus to the state house, not really knowing what was happening. He sees what is occurring. He leans into one of the students and says, what are you doing? The student says, we're fighting for change. He joins in. A cop comes up to him and says, are you a member of the NACP? And Frederick Hart, age 17, says, yes, I just joined. And he's arrested. His parents are hard. But he comes back to Carolina. He is literally harassed by his fellow students. And ultimately, he quits USC and later becomes a very accomplished historian. Another person arrested is um, Lenny Glover, who is later stabbed uh, at the local Woolworths on the corner of Hampton and uh, Taylor Streets. Hampton and Maine. This is a photograph about 50 years ago, 1965, April. One year later, Hammond School is established in direct sort of contradiction to the ideas sought in this particular image. And I suppose as I conclude that what better place might we look at the debatable, contested meanings of history than in a school like Hammond? The student in my class, she wrote a final paper, and she said that if injustice is ever to be confronted and to be reconciled, it must be brought to light. And in some ways, that is what we seek to do. How to use history to right wrongs, how to use history to illuminate the dark spaces around us so that we can move forward. This is 1959, a familiar face, a young 30-year-old preacher named Martin King Jr. here in Columbia, South Carolina. Dr. King said he sensed an awakening among young people who were no longer paralyzed by fear. They told young people later that if you want to be an effective agent of change, you should run. But if you can't run, you should walk. And if you can't walk, you should crawl. But if you can't crawl, keep moving. And that is my message to you today. As you think about the history of the unknown and the history of the uncovered, imagine how all of us can be agents of change and imagine what the new chapter of history will be if you were to write it. Thank you very much.